ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of Telefonica Basecamp, a big welcome. It's our pleasure that you use lunchtime to enrich yourself with an interesting topic. I'm Iris Rothbauer and run PR at Telefonica in Germany. Our special guest today is really special because he has been speaker here already at Telefonica Basecamp and um, yeah, no, not many people have achieved that so far. So a big welcome to Stephen Hill, the author and columnist. We all know that the odds for entrepreneurs are not good. Seven out of 10 startups fail. So the chances to become a unicorn or a 1 billion US dollar listed company are less than 0.1%. So is the success of the startups just an illusion? Stephen Hill, who has authored several books and whose commentaries and articles appear in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and The Atlantic, believes that. In his view, the system of the startups and venture capitalism is an absurd waste of investment resources and high-tech gambling game. This is just one of the pointed and also critical arguments that Stephen is proving with his book, the startup illusion, which is he is he's presenting here today at Basecamp. After staying in Berlin at American Academy, he put together an analysis about the startup culture and how it changes Germany. So, and I might say this, uh, Stephen, you are you have become a fan of the German system, especially the Mittelstand. And let me quote you: the small and medium-sized businesses are an economic engine that stands for a kind of innovation that is more impressive than development of all Facebook, Amazons, Ubers, and Apples together. But at the same time, Stephen is convinced that Germany should not blindly copy the Silicon Valley model. Instead, Germany should look for its own digital path, he proclaims in his book. So the basis should not be the unrestricted US style capitalism, but rather the social market economy, which Germany developed after World War II. So I'm sure we will have a lot of food for thought and views to discuss today. And that's exactly why we are here. So in the past six years now, Basecamp has become a leading platform for exchanging ideas about the digitalization and the digital transformation. We have another guest. Our moderator, which is Malte Leeming from Tagesspiegel. Very welcome, Malte. So until recently, he directed the Influential Opinion page. And for many years, he has worked as US re correspondent for this paper. And earlier in his career, he was advisor and speechwriter for Helmut Schmidt, the former chancellor. So we couldn't have a better fit for our moderation today. Welcome. And before we start, I would like to invite you all to join our discussion, of course, in an open Q&A session, but also via our social channels. You can find our information here on the screen behind me. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's start. And Stephen, big welcome. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Iris. Can you hear me okay? Are we working? We're live. Great. Um, thank you, Iris and uh, Agnes and Telefonica Basecamp. Uh, it's, it's a thrill for me to be back here again. And, um, and to, it's such, I think, such a great forum here to have these sorts of discussions. Really, so many of them are future-oriented and uh, trying to plot a course from where we are today to some future that <clears throat> is going to be a positive one and not um, something that we regret in 20 years' time. So a lot of what I've written in my book is, um, is trying to sift through some of these issues and give pros and cons about this digital age, digital economy, startups, uh, <clears throat> and, and then there's a couple of chapters with proposals of how we can create new, uh, not just regulations, but institutions that will actually preserve the prosperity that Germans have enjoyed and that, that Americans have enjoyed in, in the post-World War II era. <clears throat> the, uh, when I was here last year as a fellow at the American Academy in, in Berlin, 
um, I kept hearing two refrains, two things that people kept saying to me. Where are the German Facebooks and Apples and Googles? Why isn't Germany more innovative? Um, maybe we should copy Silicon Valley. I heard that quite a lot. And as someone who lives in Silicon Valley and, is, and reports on Silicon Valley, I was kind of like, wow. <clears throat> you, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Silicon Valley. There, I mean, there's certainly an, a number of good companies coming out of there. There's, there's um, a lot of creativity, a lot of innovation going on. Um, but the other side of it is that, you know, seven out of ten startups fail. And 9 out of 10 never make any money. Uh, I mean, this is not a very high batting average, used to use a baseball metaphor. Maybe that doesn't work with Germans. Um, but, you know, the, uh, I mean, think about, imagine if the government had programs and 7 out of 10 of them failed. You would call for a new government. And yet in Silicon Valley, this is just how things work. There's so much money being thrown at so many ideas. Many of them just aren't good ideas. Uh, one of my favorite recent ones is, is, is a new company has attracted a fair amount of venture capital funding, and they're going to revolutionize how we make pizza. As if, that needs, as if we need to revolutionize how we make pizza. And what they're going to do is they're going to have robots, of course, making all the pizza. But here's the really brilliant part. They're going to have vans with ovens in them. So as that van is streaking to you with your pizza, it's cooking. And when it gets to you, it will be piping hot. Well, what if there's a traffic jam? Hopefully the algorithm can account for that. Otherwise, it could arrive uh, cooked to a toast, you know? Um, but, you know, and when you look at why so many of these startups fail, it's because they get going because they attract a lot of venture capital funding. Basically, these companies are all subsidized. They're not making a profit. Uber today, you know, it's, it's the biggest startup in history. It's worth 68 billion. It's valued at 68 billion uh, euros, basically. And um, it's... It lost 3 billion euros last year. It is not making money. And it, I can go into more detail on why that is, uh, but they're basically subsidizing your ride. When you get into an Uber, you're paying only 40% of the cost of that ride. They're trying to drive down the price to get market share and drive the competition out of the business. And when you see a lot of these companies, they're seeking monopolies, which and, and ultimately reduces competition. Um, so, you know, you know this, is, this is not a model that Germany either should follow, in my view, or want to follow, because as I said, it, it's kind of a high-tech casino. There's so much money chasing so many different ideas, so many different, and, uh, and a lot of them once, you know, they're, they're, they're initially they're subsidized, but eventually the funders start saying, okay, it's time to start get to profitability, so, you know, some of these startups, they start raising the price, and that's when they discover, you know what, there's not a lot, enough people that really want to buy the product or service you've created at the price point that's going to make you profitable and then they go out of business. And so that's, that's pretty much a story you see again and again and again. Now, you know, some people say this is disruption, this is froth, this is what's good for an economy, this is where you get to creativity. Yeah, you, I suppose, to some degree. But it's also true that, you know, you're spending a lot of money to find that one out of 10 that survives and, makes, and earns profitability. I mean, Facebook, Amazon, you know, they've only recently become profitable, but they have a lot of market share. So, um, you know, here in Germany, the figures I've seen, there was about 6,000 startups in Germany. And in talking to people, they say, yeah, our batting average probably isn't any better than Silicon Valley. So that means out of those 6,000 startups, about 4,500 of those are going to fail. And about 600 will eventually earn a profit. So, you know, I mean, I sort of hung out in some of the coffee shops where a lot of the startup techies hang out. And, you know, I wanted to, I'm look, I look around, I, I want to say to them, you know, uh, like seven out of 10 of you are gonna be out of a job fairly soon because the companies you're working for are all gonna fail. And you know, maybe that's okay. Maybe that is how this sector is supposed to work, but it's, it would be good to be more aware of it. Instead, I just see all this sort of hype and enthusiasm and you know, it, yeah, seven out of 10 will fail, but it won't be my company, right? Um, it's like, you know, they asked Americans, 80% um, uh, of Americans think they're above average. <laughs> So, um, so what should we do about this? Uh, what I proposed is that there's this other uh, uh, economic sector in Germany called the Mittelstand. The Mittelstand, uh, to me, is just miraculous. The, all these small and medium enterprise companies, um, they are, the Mittelstand creates 60% of the jobs in Germany. 56% of economic output in Germany comes from the Mittelstand. They're, some of these companies are huge exporters. They're responsible, largely responsible for Germany's uh, very strong trade surplus. 
And, uh, and yet these companies are grappling with how are we going to digitize? How are we going to enter into the digital age? It seems to me there's um, uh, you know, a, 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 a simpatico there that they, if we create a hybrid of you know, sort of the digital startup model and the, the um, uh, middle stand model, that this kind of hybrid could be truly unique. And there's already some companies doing this. There's uh, one company in Germany, ironically, the name of it is Trump. <laughs> um, and, uh, and what they're doing is they're, 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 part of the new digital economy has to do with the cloud and um, big data and internet of things. Maybe some of you have heard some of these, these terms. And so they're, uh, they have this uh, product where they can put all these sensors into your plant and it allows all your machines to talk to each other. And you know, they can communicate when, um, so if something's too hot or if you need more of some input for that machine. It can uh, communicate to the managers that it needs more input. It can even communicate to the supplier of that particular input for your, your, your product, your industry. Um, it, it can communicate to them, we need more. And so you can automate a lot of these things in a ways that create what's being called smart manufacturing. And you know, this is an area where, an example where Germany could lead, creating smart manufacturing, Mittelstahn combining with startup digital uh, uh, economy. And there's a number of other examples like this in my book. So it's already starting to happen, but it sort of happens not in any coherent strategic way. And there's certain, a number of politicians today who are paying lip service to this idea, but um, not really uh, moving forward with any kind of coherent program around. There's a lot of funding for the startup stages of, of startup uh, businesses, but not a lot for middle stage. Uh, and, and, and that has to change. Um, and so, you know, basically what I, I, what I propose is that creating what I'm call, I call my book Rocket Middle Stun. For those of you who are familiar with Rocket Internet. And, uh, and you know, Rocket, a lot of people say, oh my God, if you're not familiar with Rocket Internet, it's, I, I, what I first heard about, it, I just couldn't help but, but chuckle. I mean, it's basically a company that, that does ripoffs of American businesses and then scales them in other parts of the world to the point where the, the company like Amazon or uh, eBay or whomever becomes worried that, oh my God, this new company is gonna steal our market share. So they offer a huge amount of money to buy this new company. I and mean, Rocket has sold businesses at, at, from beginning launch to the end in 100 days and making tens of millions of dollars. So they're basically just, there's no innovation there. There's no, um, there's nothing, no new product or service. They're basically a copycat company. But what they are really good at is execution, implementation, scaling. And that's what a lot of the startups in Germany are not very good at. And, and that, but that's also some of the qualities. The Mittelstand is really good at engineering, at um, implementation, these sorts of qualities. So by creating this kind of rocket Mittelstand, I think we have a, we, we, Germany could actually find a new pathway that isn't just simply a copycat of Silicon Valley. Um, the other que thing I, I kept hearing people say when I, uh, last year was, um, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, sure, there's a, in Germany we have more of the gig economy, but that's not really happening here so much. That's more of a U.S. thing. Um, you know, the workers, the workforce isn't changing that dramatically. I heard this not only from people, um, you know, in the startup community, but also I heard it from uh, a lot of German regulators and researchers and things. And, and as I start looking into that, I, I said, hmm, I'm not sure that's exactly the case. Um, if, if, just looking at what's happening to German labor markets in general, um, since the, the collapse of the economy in 2008, 2009 global collapse, pretty much all of the developed economies, Germany, United States, and others, has seen um, a loss of what we call sometimes core employment, permanent full-time jobs, good jobs that have decent pay, uh, some job security, they have a measure of social security, health care, and these sorts of things. Those are the jobs that went away in 2008, 2009. And they were replaced with jobs that are more part-time, temp jobs, um, you know, solo self-employed, uh, mini jobs, all these sorts of other categories of work. And this was, um, in fact, if you look at Germany today, even though the economy has, go, has been doing pretty well, there are fewer permanent full-time jobs today than there were in 2000. It's declined by 10%. In fact, Germany lost more permanent full-time jobs than France. I mean, Germans like to lecture the French on their economy a lot, and you're actually, 
uh, you know, in some ways, with some, using some indicators, are, are, are not doing as well. And instead, what increased was the number of part-time jobs in Germany. So the number of Germans who are working part-time now is about 27%. And the number of temp workers has increased by a third to about 12 to 13%. And in fact, um, the number of German workers working part-time or temp jobs is 50% higher than in, you know, old cowboy capitalism in the United States. Uh, the, um, if you look at minimum wage, the number of German workers, you know, there's a lot of debate about that, but it's anywhere from 10 to 16 percent are getting minimum wage. That's about three to four times higher than the number of workers in the United States that, that are receiving minimum wage. Um, the, uh, the number of German workers that are working a second job today has doubled in the last 10 years. Uh, wages for German workers on average have been fairly flat, as they have been in the United States and, and across Europe. Um, I'm just, some of the numbers that I think are surprising, I, I just want to put, get them out there. Um, among EU member states, the proportion of the workforce that earns less than 60% of the median wage is highest in Germany than in any other member state. Um, and the largest pay gap uh, between the highest and lowest paid in Europe is here in Germany. It's not as high as in the United States, but it is, it's higher here in Germany than anywhere else. So, and, and on top of the money of these jobs being created, the, the, the part-time um, temporary jobs, uh, these are precarious jobs. A lot of the workers don't have access to a, a safety net. Um, they don't have any, uh, you know, security. Now, some workers like this. Some workers like the flexibility. And, and, that, and that's understood, but the question that I think we have to all think about is how can we make part-time jobs into better jobs? How can we, I mean, right now, if you want to work part-time, you like the flexibility, you have to sacrifice security. You have to sacrifice some of the other qualities you have when you have a permanent full-time job. And if you want the permanent full-time job, you're not going to have flexibility. So I think the question is how can we have both flexibility and security? That should be the task, the goal that Germany could take the lead on. Um, and, the, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit about how I think we actually can do that. But the other component of this um, is that in talking to German regulators and to um, the researchers, I found that in all likelihood they are not counting these types of workers accurately. And that's why they're saying, oh, there's really not a problem here in the United States like we have uh, here in Germany, like we, you have in the United States. Because they're using a methodology to count. And I, this is kind of down in the weeds stuff, and, and I'm just going to go over it briefly, because I just want you, I think it's important to be aware that there is a certain methodology of how they count how you work. And what if that methodology is defective? What if it's inaccurate? And it's not capturing what's really going on in the German labor force. You know, that's, those numbers are what we use to design policy. So what they do in Germany, like in the United States, and we don't count these things accurately either, but we're at least trying to rectify that, um, is they use what's called a household survey. 1% of Germans every month are surveyed by uh, German officials. Called up on the phone, sometimes it's in, in, in person, and they ask them, tell me about how you're working. And they've been doing this for decades, the same methodology for decades. And so they'll ask them about, you know, you know the person will tell them about the first job, and they write all that down, and they'll say, and they say, are you do working a second job? And the person may or may not say yes. If they say yes, they don't ask any further. They just note it down. They're working a second job. But they don't ask him, are you working a third job or a fourth job or a fifth job? And more and more of these workers are working for multiple employers. That's where these part-time and temporary workers are. They're working for multiple employers. And they don't even ask about it because that's not the methodology that's been used for so long. And there is value in using the same methodology year after year because then you can have historical comparisons. But when you reach a point where um, you're not counting accurately, this becomes a problem. Um, and there's also a lot of evidence that uh, some research is being done by people like Larry Katz at Harvard and others that people actually don't self-report accurately. They lie. Who would have thought it? You know, so a lot, a lot of people want to admit they have a second, third, or fourth job. So you have to really ask more in depth and have different ways of asking the same question to get that information. Um, so, and, and businesses also, it turns out, don't always report uh, accurately on these sorts of things. So I asked a lot of the German uh, researchers, how many German workers are working on Upwork? Upwork is this company based in Silicon Valley. It has about 250 
regular employed workers, and those 250 workers use technology to oversee 10 million freelancers all over the world. Um, you know, on that platform, you can see workers that are doing things like graphic design, uh, computer programming, software design, uh, translation, there's architects, there's lawyers, there's a huge number of occupations industries on this platform, and you can go on there and hire one of these freelancers from anywhere in the world. So you see a German worker saying, oh, I'd like to make 60 euros an hour for this job. An American worker saying, I'll take $70 an hour. And then there's workers from Thailand, India, Philippines saying, I'll take two euros an hour for the same job. It's an online auction. You know, lowest bid often wins. So I mean, it used to be, you know, when they wanted to outsource, they had to move a plant somewhere, and that became you know, a barrier to doing that. It's a lot of money to move your plants. They don't need to move plants anymore. They can just go on Upwork and hire a freelancer from anywhere in the world. So you're out, been outsourced, our jobs are being outsourced through an online labor platform. And um, these workers uh, are very skilled in Thailand, India. Um, they have access to technology. They can finish, finish the job, upload it to, um, to the web or use Dro Dropbox or any other reason, way to deliver the product. And, um, and so there's, in many ways, there's not a reason not to hire them. So I asked, you know, I was asking, how many German workers are on this platform? He said, I don't know. We don't know. We have no idea. Really? We don't know. Have you tried to look? No. We don't look at those. We don't, you know, not, it's not, ha not happening enough. Why should we do it? So it took me 20 minutes to go on the Upwork platform using their filters to find out there are 18,157 German workers working at that time when I did, it, did the research. There's probably more now. Um, you can now see the, who they are. You see their photo. You can see where they live. You can see what they do. It's easy to track these workers. And here's the thing. If, if, so say that these workers are being hired by a company in the United States or hired by a company in Russia or it could be anywhere in the world. And so the, the, play, the company that's hiring them is not telling the German authorities, hey, we've hired this worker. This worker made 2,000 euros uh, for us la uh, working for us last year. And that worker probably isn't reporting that income either. Because why would it? It's all happening under the radar. So just on one platform with these up 18,000 Upwork, Upwork workers, approximately using low uh, kind of conservative numbers for the amount of wages they're likely earning, about 71 million euros in income per year is not being reported. And about 10.4 million euros that, would, that you'd normally would pay into the health care fund is not being reported, not being collected. That's just one platform. How many, uh, you know, there's, there's dozens of these platforms now. And the, um, there is, the only groups that are really trying to count these workers are labor unions, Verdi, IG Metall. They're trying to count these workers, and they've worked with academics and different institutions to try. And they, they've come up with an estimate anywhere from 1 million to 2 million German workers are working through these platforms now. And just, again, using conservative numbers, that would suggest about 4 billion euros in lost income that is not that is going untaxed, and about 600 million euros that is not being paid into the health care fund. This is serious money. If more and more workers start working this way, you will completely drain your welfare system. You know, that, those taxes are used to pay for education, for transportation, uh, you know, all the good public services that you have here in Germany, health care, all sorts of things. And so, and yet, these re regulators and the researchers are like, we don't know. And the fact that I can find out in 20 minutes what was on Upwork just tells you, like, it's not hard to figure it out. They just aren't bothering to do it. And that should be troubling, I think, to, uh, to people. And in fact, the McKinsey Global Institute, which is a rather, uh, you know, well-known business consultancy, they've done a study in which they used government sources, and then they supplemented that with their own surveys and using surveys from other researchers and came up with a more comprehensive methodology, in my view. And what they found, that the number of what they called independent workers, which are workers that are outside the traditional employer-employee relationship, the number of independent workers in Germany is 90% higher than what German official sources uh, say. That's, in terms of you know, your welfare state going forward, that's a big number. That, that could uh, impact things dramatically. So, um, what to do. Very briefly, what I proposed is, um, uh, I mean, there's many things I proposed, but the one I'm going to talk about just briefly is what's called a portable safety net. Because as I said, we've got to figure out a way to make these part-time jobs good jobs and allow workers who like the flexibility to keep that but not sacrifice security. So here's how a portable safety net would work. Every worker who works for a business 
um, that work would have created for her or him a, a, what I call an individual security account. And every business that hires that worker would, ha would pay into that, that uh, individual security account a certain amount above the wage that would be prorated to the number of hours that you work for that business. So let's say you work 10 hours a week for a business, then that business would pay about 25% of a 40-hour work week what you normally get for your, 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 uh, well, your social security needs. If another employer hired that worker for five hours, that would be prorated to, uh, you know, like one-eighth, five of, into 40. So um, by doing this, you'd allow workers to work for multiple employers, have that flexibility, go from job to job if they either like that lifestyle or they just can't find something more permanent. And they would still be able to collect from each business something that goes into their Social Security to pay for their health care, their retirement, their injured worker compensation. I mean, a lot of these freelancers don't even have injured worker. In Germany, United States, I mean, you get injured on the job, you're on your own. So you'd have something there. And that would give them some degree of security. And, you know, I think if we do that, I mean, there are certainly workers in Germany, as in the United States, become subject to what's called job lock. They have a good permanent full-time job, and they hate it. Be but they stay there because, you know, they have a family, they need the security. And so have creating this type of system would actually open up the system to l let that that you know that worker seek her or his own place where they feel like they're being they're able to use their creativity um, in a way that uh, feels good to them so um, and the other thing that would be would be good about doing this type of system and I should say I mean well uh, let me finish that thought thought first is that you know a lot of, right now the way for a lot of business let's say I'm in business and you're in business and you're in business we're all competing against each other right well, let's say you're hiring the freelancers, and you're hiring the freelancers, and I'm hiring permanent full-time. You're paying about 25% less in labor costs than I am. So that puts pressure on me to do that, too, in order to compete. It's, you know, it's like the steroids of the economies. It's like, think of the Tour de France. Once, you know, a fair number of the bicyclists are all taking the steroids and juicing, and they're winning, it puts pressure on the rest of the pack to have to do the same thing. That's what happens in this sort of thing. So if you, if, if you made it so that you're not actually losing as workers, um, you know, the employer is still going to have to pay that 25% for Social Security costs. They still might want to hire f freelancers and have the flexibility in hiring and firing, but it won't be because they're saving 25%, and so maybe they'll hire the permanent full-time instead. And so it might act as a check on the permanent full-time job that's disappearing. So the future economy would have a combination of uh, part-time jobs, people working part-time with, with a portable safety net. They have the flexibility and the security, and a certain number of full-time permanent jobs. And this is going to be even more important as we move further into the age of automation and robots. We haven't even talked about that. But this is the type of system that would allow uh, workers to continue to have enough uh, income and enough security to keep driving the consumer markets that make capitalist uh, economies work. Um, anyway, so why don't I just end it there? I've already gone longer than I was supposed to. My apologies. But we're going to have a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for this lively, most inspiring lecture and summary of your book that just came up. And thank you for having us here, Iris Ruppauer and Agnes Michalik, and for the kind introduction. And thank you all for coming uh, and listening to you. I mean, most people have time because I think they work in flexible jobs <laughs> to come here at, at uh, 12 o'clock at noon. They wouldn't be able in pre-digital times, I think, to come here to listen to your book presentation. <laughs> right. Um, let me tell you first how we met. We met a couple of years ago in San Francisco in a restaurant. I was part of a um, group of journalists doing the usual Silicon Valley tour and Tesla and Facebook. Uh, what's the famous slogan? Move fast, break things in yeah. Facebook and uh, Airbnb. Do it now, ask for permi Again, permission later. Ask for that. And, and I was quite, I mean, like, like most people are who, who were there for the first time, I was, I mean, inspired by all these what they show you, the sneaker culture and so on and so on, everything is relaxed. And then I met you and I thought, oh, he is the party pooper of Silicon Valley. <laughs> Excuse me for this <laughs> expression, but are you? <laughs> um, 
I, yeah, probably so. <laughs> the skunk at the garden party. Is, is, it always so depends on the party. Sometimes right. it's necessary. Right. <laughs> um, no, I have many friends that work in Silicon Valley and, you know, have talk, been in meetings with some of the CEOs. And uh, it's a very active discussion. I mean, some of the CEOs, they acknowledge many of my points, um, you know, especially in terms of portable safety net. They see the merit in having something like this. But they also want to have contractors, and it's kind of a intricacy of U.S. labor law, but if they, they're afraid if they pr give their workers health care, then they're going to be considered an employee, and then you have to pay for the 30, 25, 30 percent of all the Social Security costs. So there's a lot of ways that the laws in the United States, as in Germany, are just not keeping up with the digital age as it's coming at us so fast. And so I think part of what I'm doing is just simply raising red flags. I mean, I recognize, you know, I have my, uh, my s smartphone and, uh, you know, I, there's many good things coming out of Silicon Valley. Um, but we have to start thinking about what do, the future, what do we want the future to look like in 20 years? And, uh, you know, if you, if you listen to the typical CEO of Silicon Valley, they'll, their basic perspective is, look, I'm, I'm creating a great product. You're going to love it. I'm going to make a billion dollars. What could be wrong? Well, actually, quite a, a few things could be wrong. <laughs> and, and, and it's also, it's literally true that the incentives for a business are different than the incentives for your society. Like, for example, the incentives for a business is to reduce their labor costs. Even, I mean, you know, if, if a business can, getting rid of all their employees and putting in all robots, that's in their interest. That's, that's good for their business. And yet if every business did that, it would be a catastrophe because there'd be no one would have jobs and no one would have money to buy up the goods and services the businesses are producing, right? So we have to realize that, of course, these businesses, they want government out of their way. That's when in Silicon Valley you hear that all the way. Just get government out of my way and let me just make a good product and service for heaven's sakes. And yet if you do that and let them just do whatever they want, you can cause a lot of problems. Well, let's talk about jobs, for example. If, if we look at the, at the five most valuable listed uh, companies in, in the world, it's Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. Um, with the exception of Amazon, the other four, they just invented new services they're creating. They are not competing with others they throw out. There's just uh, like search engines and the, um, social media and all these things and computers and so on that just haven't been there 10, 20 years ago. So they added new jobs, thousands and thousands and making billions and billions of money. So what are complain about? Nobody's lost their job. They invented jobs. They created new jobs. Well, there's two things about that. One, these companies, after a certain point, they, they try to become monopolies. So. It would be good, I mean, to have competition. Why shouldn't there be more Facebooks, more Googles, more competition? Um, part of it is because these companies do things to actively create monopoly. And once you have monopoly, you actually reduce competition. Um, the second part of it is that these companies actually aren't creating that many jobs. If you look at Google and Apple, for example, they employ about 60 to 70,000 people. Well, you compare that to an auto company or to Siemens, they employ hundreds of thousands of people. So, in fact, in Silicon Valley, they want to use technology and algorithms and software to replace as many humans as they can. So, yeah, they're creating jobs, they created new products, new services, we all like them. Um, but, you know, you have to keep in perspective that if, if not enough people have enough jobs and if they're trying to replace all these jobs, I mean, Kodak, for example, used to be, we all took our photos with Kodak, right? They employed about 40, 50,000 people. Well, the new the Kodak of the digital age is Instagram, which is owned by Facebook. And Facebook in total only has about 10,000 employees. So Instagram has far less than that. So, and, and Kodak is pretty much out of business. So, you know, that's creative destruction. That's how the economy is supposed to work. Un that's understood. But some of the experts are saying this is going to happen at a, so, a, a much faster, more accelerated pace. You know, some of you have probably seen the studies where 50% of jobs are going to be eliminated by robotization. I think those numbers are probably, um, I mean, they looked at, is it, is it possible to do it? Yeah. But reality is that it won't be profitable to do it. Like some of the jobs in there are getting your nails painted. A robot could do that. Right. But how many people are going to get their nails painted? And will it be profitable for some company to have a robot do that? instead of paying, you know, what often is a low-wage worker. But is some your jobs. main criticism against digitalization or the consequence of digitalization? The consequences. Just really. the consequences. And because, and I mean, there was first industrial revolution, the pre-electricity or assembly line, where, I mean, we had protest against this, but you just have to arrange yourself with it. 
and it changes the working place as well. I mean, electricity means you can work at night because you get, uh, an assembly line means you can work more productively. Right. So you just have to adapt with these things. You right? have to adapt and I think also think about how do we get the good of these technologies and not the bad. In fact, in my book, I have an example of drones. You know, drones are, um, I live in San Francisco, close to the beach, and you go down there to the beach, and you know, all the, the, the guys used to have their model planes buzzing around, right? Now they have drones. And they're flying them around, and, and they've mounted on their drones uh, a little GoPro video camera, like the size of your finger. And so, you know, people are out there on the beach, women are laying there in their bathing suits, their bikinis, and they don't realize that, you know, four meters above their head is a drone that's videotaping them on the beach. <laughs> I've asked some of these guys, well, what do you do with this footage? Oh, I don't really do anything with it. It's just kind of fun to, you know, okay. On YouTube. <laughs> yeah. And so, and yet, so that's one example of the types of drones can be an invasion of our price. Of course, they're being used for military purposes, but they're also used um, for agriculture to, uh, they're, they're really effective at detecting drought conditions before, um, you know, it really hits badly. We've never had a vehicle, commercial airliners fly too high. Helicopters are too expensive, and uh, we've never really had a technology that could so easily cruise the landscape and take uh, video or snap or photos or what have you. So there's an example, of, uh, and then another uh, use I've seen on YouTube, there's this crazy Russian guy who, who takes drones and he mounts guns on them. And then he <laughs> sets up all these dummy humans, and he zooms in with them and just, you know, with these... Uh, scare them. And, and Yeah, it's scary. He just blows them away with these, with these rapid-fire machine guns. And so there's pros and cons to these technologies. Um, Uber, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. U.S. taxi service isn't so good. So, um, you know, they needed another service, and Uber comes in, refuses to follow the laws and regulations. That was a problem, but people were willing to overlook it. What's causing problems for Uber now is that there are so many of them that they are badly contributing to congestion. Do you use Uber in San Francisco? I don't know. No. Um, but the... Uh, but I guess you're the only one, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, actually, there are a lot of people that use it, but more people in San Francisco do not use it, and yet they're putting up with the consequences of but the people who do. They have the same system with bikes. They well, have I mean, here's, share, it, share system with bikes. Here's, the, here's the, the, the factor that there are 1,800 taxi cabs in San Francisco, and there are now 45,000 Uber and Lyft drivers. There are Ubers that come, uh, drivers that come from, you know, Southern California to, to, to San Francisco. There are drivers that come from Idaho to San Francisco. They, they come and they'll stay for a week. They sleep in their car. They don't know the city. They just drive all day and all night to try and make some money, and then they go back. So, um, you know, and in the meantime, the congestion in San Francisco, I've lived there since the mid-'90s. It's never been, even during, some people say, well, it's because the economy is better. I've seen San Francisco in good and bad times. It has never been like this. People are really fed up with it. Uh, they're fed up with Uber drivers, and the poor Uber drivers, of course, are being blamed for just trying to make a living. So you have to have a limit. You, you can have too much of a good thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, another example I'll just say briefly is Airbnb. Here in Berlin, you passed a law saying uh, we're going to crack down on Airbnb because what happened, I mean, Airbnb also started out as a good idea. The idea of letting someone rent out a spare room in their home, make some extra money, especially in a down economy, what could be wrong with that? Well, what happened was the professional real estate operatives got involved. And they got in and they are evicting people out of their building because they can double and triple their revenue by renting on Airbnb to tourists instead of to regular people. There goes your housing stock. There goes your rents. As your, the number of housing available to locals declines, your rents go up. This is what's happening in city after city after city. Well. Um, Airbnb, uh, Berlin passed this law that basically said they were trying to return it to its original mission. Uh, they say you can't rent out whole apartments or flats or homes, only a spare room, and you have to be there, and you can only rent out 50% of your flat. That's what it's, the law it's says. It's called in German the Zweckentfremdungsverbot. Very, ter very terrible name. Yeah. Well, so, you know, this is the law. Airbnb knows the law. They have their data. They know who's breaking the law. They could easily kick people off their platform who's breaking the law. I just got the numbers just yesterday from, uh, there's a website called Inside Airbnb. What they can do is they can, what's called scrape the Airbnb website and take all their data and they can analyze it. The number of listings in, on Airbnb since this law went into effect a year ago has gone up by 54%. And the number of whole homes that are being rented has gone up by 46%. But see, so the law has completely failed because you need me, the data it, from Airbnb to it, allow to me to. But, but I think we have to be precise about what is the, the consequence of digitization 
and of criminal behavior. I mean, for example, the, the platform Upwork, you said, I mean, if people work here, get the job, they are obliged to pay taxes. If they don't, they are criminals who can be followed. So, but, but the question of, of criminal behavior seems for me to be different towards the consequence of digitalization. I mean, even without digital revolution, people can be criminals. Right. Well, the point is, is that it's really hard to enforce laws with these companies. One, they, they try to evade them as much as they can, including paying taxes. I mean, Airbnb should be paying hotel and occupancy tax. Uh, that's uh, an important source of revenue for local governments. And, um, but they, uh, they don't pay it. The, they say, we're, not, we're just a technology company. We're not a hotel company. Get the money from the hosts. But you don't know where the hosts are. If you don't have the data from Airbnb, you don't know who's doing it, how many nights, how much they're charging per night. You can't figure out how much to tax them, whether they're doing it more than the law allows. Um, you know, Uber doesn't turn over information about their drivers. Um, so there's a law in Seattle that was passed to try and help organize these drivers, but they can't find them. Is it, more and more, these companies have what's called distributed workforces. They're located all over the place. So labor unions here in Germany have a right to go into a physical location and organize. That's a law they, write, they have by law. But if there's no physical location, the labor unions can't organize. But then your main argument is not against Uber and Airbnb per se, but against the misuse and not adapting by government officials or law enforcement officials. Well, it's, it's both because they, they could, as I said, Airbnb, they have their data. They know who's breaking the law in Berlin. They could send them an email saying, hey, by the way, here's the law. We know you're breaking it. And if you break it, we're going to kick you off our platform. But you know why they don't do that? Because they'll, they'll tell you, well, 80 percent of our, uh, our posts, uh, our hosts are, you know, just renting out a spare room every now and then. What they don't tell you is that the 20 percent are the professionals and they make up 50 percent of Airbnb's revenue, their number of nights uh, renting. And so it's both that the laws aren't catching up, the regulators aren't doing what they need to do, they need to get e Airbnb's data in order to enforce that law. Airbnb refuses to give up the data. They say our hosts have a right to privacy. Okay, that's what the excuse they use. But when you turn your home into a, a, um, a bed and breakfast, into a hotel, uh, hotels don't have a right to privacy. I mean, when you do that, when you, be make a, when you become a commercial operation, whether it's your car, or your home or whatever, at that point, you, you have to sacrifice some of your privacy, in my view. What is, what is a digitalized working environment? I mean, there are so many it, it, digital techniques are used in, in almost every branch, in ca car manufacturing, uh, in, in governments are using it, maybe not in Berlin, but in every other town. And uh, am I, as a journalist, am I a digital worker, for your definition? I'm um, using Google, Twitter, Facebook, we have an online edition. Am I a digital worker? I don't know. Do you think you are? <laughs> I think so. But I'm just using this. I mean, so. I mean, wait, wait. You know, I mean in terms how of labor. Do you, how do you define that? There I are mean, labor categories. And so um, there is no category for a digital worker in terms of the law. Yeah. Um, so if you're using digital means to, as part of your, your job, I mean, pretty much so many, most people are uh, in, in, yeah. in, in, in today. So, I mean, everybody's a digital worker in that regard. But in terms of the law, the law doesn't distinguish at this point between digital workers or non-digital workers. So, and I mean, you have certain categories. You, know, you have regularly employed. You have here in Germany, you have solo self-employed. We call them uh, uh, independent contractors in the United States. There's a lot of discussion about whether we should be creating new categories of workers to account for this digital world. And, um, you know, there's pros and cons to doing that. Yeah. I have another question. I will shortly open it up to the, to the audience. Uh, apologize me for that. Um, why do you tie your criticism of certain working conditions to per, just to digitalization? I mean, for example, um, employment and labor law in Germany applies to every branch, if it's digital or not. And I mean, the fate of a, if you work in a bakery and have you get up at four o'clock in the morning, the working condition is not so good as well. So where's the, where's the connection between bad working conditions and digitalization, especially in Germany, where the same law applies to every branch? You know, that's a very good question. I mean, no question, these trends that I talked about earlier, they've been happening for a, a few decades and before we had digitalization. So it's not digitalization that's really causing them per se. But what digitalization uh, represents is the next turn in the road down this same road. It's going to take what's been going on for two to three decades, and it's going to make it even more of a crisis. So it's, uh, I think we have to, I mean, there's no question that, I mean, in terms of like having a portable safety net, there are a number of workers who are working in the traditional economy, and they've been subject to some of these conditions where they should have had a portable safety net um, 
I, I think we should extend it to all workers. Uh, there shouldn't be good jobs and bad jobs. It, and, it, and it shouldn't be right. broken down by digital workers and traditional economy. Every worker in Germany should be able to have a good job, which I define as being a job where you're working where you, you like and you have the, the protections, the social security protections that you need for you and your family. And, and right now that's not the, the standard. The standard is there are some jobs that are kind of the, the, up, the upper tier jobs and there are others that are the, you know, the mini jobs and some of the other jobs that are just not very good jobs. I mean, it's, I think it's not a quiz when, for example, when Germany finally implemented a, a, a minimum wage, the number of mini jobs dropped because, you know, the minimum wage is only 8.50 euros, uh, 8.50 euro an hour. And so that means a lot of people make, in mini jobs were making less than that. And so they, you know, the employer said, oh, this is going to cost me money. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, to use these mini jobs anymore. So think, last short question, yeah. quick answer, please. The yeah. three things you like most on digitalization. Um, good products, you know, being, some of the, uh, these things are amazing. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, having, if we can combine security with the flexibility, it does prov prov uh, provide a lot of opportunity. Certain types of workers who have been called labor market outsiders, including women, women, uh, you know, with children who, um, you know, can't always have the permanent full-time job because they have, a, 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 I mean, men should be doing more of it. No question about it, but you know, the reality is, is that the, unfortunately they don't. So I think you know that kind of flexibility. In fact, uh, Minister of Labor uh, Andrea Nahles, some of her proposals in the the White Book, Weisbuka, am I saying that? <laughs> Can you? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're 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 dedicated to this, trying to uh, create a little, bit, a little bit more flexibility with this kind of digital economy, and especially for women. So I think maybe that was only two, but in, in just of keeping it brief, I'll. Thanks I'll, a lot. I'll, yeah. So. Um, Yes, um, questions please, and I would love you, if you have questions, there are two microphones around, uh, please introduce yourself and limit the question to one, not I have uh, three, one, two, three questions, just one okay. question, please. Are we doing morning questions all the time, or? or? It's, uh, it's on? Yes. Okay. My name is Radu Zeletin, and um, uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is, I have the impression that you are a control freak. <laughs> You'd like to control everything, and uh, this is actually, uh, for me, actually not, not very, uh, let's say, uh, not very, it doesn't make any sense in a digitized world. world. Uh, you are speaking about um, um, part-time jobs, about half-time jobs, uh, about full-time jobs. Uh, and I think actually we are living actually in a sector, in an industry, where this notion of time uh, has no, no, no meaning actually. Um, I think uh, if you look in your, in your, in your, I don't know, in, the, in your plane, you see people working actually all the time. Uh, if you speak about startups, uh, nobody looks actually at the time you are spending there. So we, 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 we are moving actually from a, from a society which actually your remuneration and your, it's based on the time you spend somewhere in, what, in, 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 a, in a society where you are paid for what you are doing. So you, you have a product actually to, to put it on that. And the problem is actually that the society did not accept that. That's what the unions have problems with all, the whole system. It's your type of, 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 of thinking uh, about, uh, you know, uh, uh, generalization and uh, paying actually a, a, a global, global you society. Come and to your question. I have to be my, fair to the rest sorry, of the okay, audience. My question yeah. will be, do you think that actually um, um, in the future a new, completely new system based on what you are producing and not on the time uh, will, make, uh, uh, will make much more sense. Um, you know, I, there's a number of writers and thinkers, Jeremy Rifkin and others that are proposing that someday we're all going to be our own, what he calls prosumers, both consumers and producers. We'll all have our 3D printers and we'll all be able to produce our own a lot of our products and, and um, you know that people will be able to make their own future and uh, it's a lovely uh, dream um, and you know so, some of that some people combine that with a guaranteed basic income or universal basic income um, again it's a lovely idea 
uh, you know, that somehow we could get paid for not doing any work and then we could just do our creative things besides, uh, you know, and, and, and be fulfilled in that way. Um, the reality is, is it's not, it's not going to happen. Uh, I mean, certainly not in the United States. Donald Trump is not about to in, in put into place a UBI and even looking 20 years down the road. I mean, here's the, here's the thing to think about. What we do know is that for the last 20 to 30 years, we've had more technology. We've had, you know, amazing technology. Increased labor productivity to some degree. Not as much as it was, you know, 50 years ago, but, but some. And yet, the profits from that has gone into the pockets of fewer and fewer people. The wages have remained flat in Germany, in the United States, and elsewhere. So in other words, the political system was not able to get a wage increase from the economic system. Okay? So to think that the political system will be able to get the economic system to actually just give us money is just far-fetched. It's, it's not rooted in the real world, in my view. It's, and it's actually a distraction from what the real hard work we need to do to make these technologies work for people instead of being the, the profits being funneled into fewer and fewer profits so, uh, uh, pockets as a result of them. So, uh, I mean, I hope I, I'd love to be proven wrong on this, but I mean, no one knows. Everyone's got their crystal balls out to figure this kind of thing out. And all we know is what, we can only look at what we know and we see the trends, we see the trajectories. And I, I can go into, you know, lots of other further statistical evidence of this kind of thing that I think is far more persuasive than simply the hope and prayer that, uh, that these technology companies um, that are going to control the robots, control the automation, unless we change the laws and regulations in a certain way. I mean, the only thing that would, the, poor pers the only thing that would push them to do it is if finally we reach a, such a point where not enough people have enough money to buy up the goods and the services to buy, and so then they say, wow, we've got to give people money so they can consume. But that's not how they think. Again, you know, they, the, the incentives of an individual business are to sell to whomever you can. You don't care who it is. So if you have consumers in China that supposedly is going to be stronger than Europe and the United States someday, you'll sell there. You're not going to worry about the Germans who don't have enough money to buy. You let them scrap on, you know, the sharing, get the crumbs from the sharing economy and gig work. That's what, that would be, the, they'll just sell to wherever. And they're not going to suddenly say, oh, we've got to hand them money um, so they can buy my products. I just don't, I just don't see, see that happening. So. Thank you. So next question, please. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Um, thanks, uh, Mr. Hill. Uh, enjoyed your talk. You said uh, in the beginning we should aim at uh, a Could hybrid. You please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Ulrich Hotelet. I'm a freelance journalist. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you said we should aim at a hybrid of uh, the German Mittelstand and the startups. Um, could you please elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, I mean, do you mean just using more digital machines uh, in the future uh, by the German Mittelstand or, yeah, what, what, what do you Thanks. think? Thanks, that's a good question. I mean, the first thing is, in talking to a lot of people, that, like how many of the, the Berlin hipsters go out to where the auto companies are and go out into the middle of the country and visit these companies and get to know them? You know, it's a very different culture. The culture of the startup community is fast-paced. It's, um, you know, everything happens now. Uh, we spend money. Now we ramp up now, and we, if we break laws, we apologize later. Um, it, the, uh, you know, the, the culture in the middle stand is, is family oriented. It's slowly plotted, you know, uh, uh, precision engineering. So these are two cultures. They need to meet each other first, and it sounds like it's not happening that, to, to a great extent here. And out of that synergy, I think other ideas will come. Um, at, you know, I mean, Deutsche Bahn, for example, is using some digital startups to help improve some of their products to make service better. There's so many good companies here in Germany that need to have access to, you know, the young entrepreneur who's really savvy on computers and digital programming and all these sorts of things. And um, so, I, I mean, I can't give you, a, you know, the exact concrete thing except, like, let's bring people together for starters. Let's create that bridge between these two sectors and then see what kind of synergy comes out of that. And you know, someone needs to organize it. The, the politicians aren't doing it. Need, no, no NGOs, no, uh, you know, maybe this is something that for some of the stiftungs here to do, to organize conferences where they consciously bring these people together. At Republica, uh, I was there two days ago, it was an amazing conference, but there weren't any Middlestan there, you know? And the Middlestan have their conferences and there aren't necessarily any digital 
workers from Berlin, Hamburg, or Munich there. I, I'm sorry. Have you looked at the program to, uh, Industry 4.0? Yes, Industry 4.0, Arbeit 4.0. There's many 4.0s in Germany. There's even a Mittelstahn 4.0. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the, those are all good things. Uh, but in talking to people, it sounds like the bridge hasn't been made yet. And I think that that's a good place to start. Okay. I think here. Here we, uh, excuse me. Okay, you yeah. have the mic. So you have to wait a little longer. Huh. Maybe we maybe we should we should collect three questions and have your last words because it's half past one right now. We have still have food. And, okay. What time do we finish? Uh, let's say in ten minutes from now. So three more. Three of who who else has a question? One, two, three, four. We should collect them all. I would say. Okay, there's some context, but I'll try to be quick. So, hello, my name is Johanna Blies. I'm a student here from Berlin. And last year I was interning a little bit south from San Francisco, actually in Tijuana. <laughs> and <Where>? in Tijuana. <laughs> San Francisco, don't think of that as a little bit south. I think we can say yeah. <laughs> for, for the people Santa living Clara, in Tijuana, it? it's not so far. Right. From the other right. side of the border, yes. But right, right. <laughs> um, so, um, that's in Mexico, people, people don't know. Yeah. Americans call it Tijuana. <laughs> so um, the taxi syndicate in Tijuana actually is pretty strong, and I hate, to, I hate having to bolster stereotypes there, but it does have organized crime affiliations. And um, there were social tensions, a lot of them because of like price, um, like between Uber and the taxi syndicate. So a few weeks ago, uh, an Uber driver was actually shot. Um, so here we have the social tensions that you mentioned escalating into physical violence. And I just wanted to ask you whether you think that's a unique scenario or whether, even though I hate having to go all pessimistic about this, but whether you actually think this could happen more often. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hello, Stephen. Hello. <laughs> uh, I'd like to know, you would suggest a, a mixed economy, uh, part-time jobs, security, and, uh, okay, a lot of uh, freelancers activities in order to have the same uh, level as uh, we used to have with a full-time job, with security, as in German we used to have. Yeah. Now with uh, Industry 4.0, how could, how do you think exactly the culture fighting between security and unemployment and uh, freelancers' cultures on another countries. That's what I would like to, to know. I, I, say the question again? Yes. Just the question. How do, uh, what do you suggest yeah. about the fighting about the security culture, right. it's what we have here, yeah. and the other countries from freelancers and uh, um, not securance, not insurance, and so on? In the back. Okay, sorry. Uh, my name is Helena Kaupla, and I, um, I very much liked, uh, especially the part of your talk about the portable safety network, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate more about these structural disadvantages against independent workers. So there were two pieces that implicitly, I felt, came up in this talk. Um, one has to do with, well, the portable safety network. I know in 
Germany, freelancers. Um, I had to do a little bit of research about it before I got admitted into the Kunstler Sozialen Kasse, but as a normal freelancer, there would have been uh, a major extra payment that I would have had to uh, make as a freelancer because of the minimum income <laughs> uh, requirement uh, for the contribution. And then the other idea that came was with uh, was Malte Leming sort of brought up had to do with legal issues. Um, there's sometimes an idea that the law written equals law enforced, but of course large companies, especially dealing with small quantities of purchases, I had such an instance just yesterday, <laughs> um, I cannot spend uh, five hours arguing a 26 euro uh, purchase, but the large company um, can uh, charge this from me. So there's, um, there are kind of two topics that came up, but if I'd be really interested to hear what your thoughts are on these structural disadvantages against uh, freelancers and independent workers. Thank you. I think that, that's a lot now. If we don't have somehow more urgent questions, I would say I would give you some time for four difficult but very good questions. Yeah, I'm taking the last one. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, what I'm proposing is, is kind of a ca as ca for all. Um, you know, the, the, the type of uh, program that exists now for journalists and artists and musicians in which the government and anyone who hires them pays a certain amount towards their social security needs, basically putting all workers on that kind of footing. Uh, there are actually another type of worker called home workers who also have their own version of ka as ka right now. And so Germany knows how to do this. That's the, that's the really cool thing here. You, you already have it just for a small number of workers in certain occupations. All you have to do is just take that and ramp it up and, and make it work for, for all workers. And that way, you know, you, you don't have the, the bad job, the bad part-time job anymore. You have the good uh, part-time job and people can have the flexibility and security. I mean, there's certainly a lot of other laws that are, need to be changed for, for freelancers that don't work uh, very well. So, I mean, some of the ones I inter people I interviewed, they were telling me how, like for your health care, um, you, 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 I don't think he was in Ka as Ka, he was just a freelancer. He, he has solo self-employed, so he has to estimate how much his income is going to be for the year. And then you pay health care based on that. And if you actually have a good year and make more than that, you have to pay something at the end of the year, topping off. But if you have a bad year, they don't cut it back for you. So it doesn't work both ways. And so you're penalized by being a freelancer in this way. Um, there's a lot of little laws like that. that uh, and I, I only came upon a few of them in, in interviewing a lot of people that really should be looked at to say, how do we make it okay to be part-time? How do we make it okay to be freelancer? But in fact, the trend is going the opposite. The government has this assumption that the, you know, the, the each, what do you call it, ich age, you know, me, ich, 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 ich age, ich age yeah. <laughs> me incorporated, that started under the Schroeder government, it hasn't worked. A lot of people became, uh, you know, their own <laughs> CEOs of their own business, <laughs> and they weren't, they just didn't have, the, you know, not everybody can be an entrepreneur. Um, they don't have what, what, you know, what it takes to do that. And so they're trying to cut it back and they're trying to, and they're actually thinking about requiring freelancers and solo self-employed now and beyond paying both the employer's half and the, their half of health care. They have to do the same thing for the pension. And that's just going to discourage more and more people from working this way. And, and that's actually seems to be their goal. So, you know, rather than go that route, because they think there's enough permanent full-time jobs, even though the trend is this way on permanent full-time jobs, it doesn't make any sense to me. Rather go that route, I think the portable safety net is going to really allow the economy to, to, to be, it's going to deal with the realities of where the economy is going, and it's going to allow workers to really have the types of support that they need to, you know, be a brilliant worker. Um, so, um, Tijuana, <laughs> taxi, uh, you know, bat violence. This has been a problem in Mexico and other countries in Latin America, and, in, you know, France, they've, uh, there's been a lot of upset French taxi drivers who have smashed Uber cars and done these sorts of things. Um, we, we haven't seen too much of that in the United States, though you've seen a lot of protests. Um, you know, there has been some, uh, a law passed in Seattle to allow Uber, uh, Uber drivers to organize um, as, as a sort of quasi-union because by law, as they're called what's called independent contractors, they by law aren't allowed to organize a union. So they're, they're kind of doing this end run around the law. Um, you know, it's, will we see more of this? Yeah, I think so. I think as, 
if we don't start coming up with the rules to regulate these companies in a way, we haven't even talked about data and what you know companies are doing with our personal data, um, the way companies are, are using surveillance in the workplace. The, the company I spoke about, Upwork, uh, when you to work for them, you have to download a suite of software, and that allows whoever's hired you to take snapshots, uh, screenshots of your computer. They can see what's on your computer. They can track your keystrokes. They can track your mouse strokes. Um, you know, and, and that's you're only a freelancer. You're, you might be working for five or six companies, and each one of them wants to have exclusive uh, domain over your screenshots. So you know, there's a lot of issues like this that are coming, and are already here, and they're coming in a, in a bigger and bigger way. In the U.S., a lot of workers are being told by their employers, um, you, you can't turn off your smartphone, your work smartphone on the weekends. We want you available. Um, so uh, I think as more and more people are feeling this kind of squeeze, we're going to be pushed to, to do some things. And some people might react violently, but hopefully we'll come up with the regulations to, uh, in a way that um, could, can you know, get the good behavior from these, these businesses. And, and this is not a new thing with capitalism, right? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, is it any surprise that, you know, we have to figure out a way to regulate these companies to get the good that they're producing and to decrease the bad? I mean, this is just kind of normal for uh, a capitalist society. Um, <laughs> I can't read my handwriting. Uh, Security flexibility. That's what I wrote down. Yeah. And, and then the middle stand, who plays the role of bringing them together? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I think, as I said, stiff tongues could do it. I mean, it's going to take some money. Bertelsmann Foundation might do something like this. Uh, I mean, if any of you are connected with any of these, this, this would be a good suggestion. Is that what you meant by mediator? Is that, is that what you meant by mediator? Okay, yeah. Um, universities are already doing some of the research, uh, but the, like the universities at the, uh, what do they call them, Fachschule? Is that, how do you say that? Fachschule, yeah. Yeah, they tend to be more affiliated with um, a lot of the Middlestan companies, and then the, the bigger universities, the more um, you know, theoretical uh, engineering as opposed to the practical hands-on engineering uh, is happening at the Fachschule, and then the other, the, the theoretical engineering at the bigger universities. So it, you know, it seems like the universities could play a role here to some degree, or just organize conferences. Uh, you know, if you're gonna have a Republica conference, have a an entire half a day about the Middlestan and digital technology and, and invite people from the different sectors to be on panels and to talk. Um, I, you know, it, it's, it's not, this is not rocket science. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of building those bridges and then letting that creativity start to bubble and see what people come up with. Yeah. Rocket middle stun. <laughs> <laughs> I love that concept. Stephen, thank you. I think, uh, is, uh, one more. Okay, one more. Okay. Hi, Stephen. I'm Paul from Hamburg, as far as you know. <laughs> I'm a journalist. Um, as I remember, um, when I read your book, um, you uh, were describing some contacts with uh, governmental officials and politicians here in Berlin and with uh, unions as well. Um, do I have uh, gotten the impression that they are open for your critical approach or not? Some are very open and in fact I couldn't have done the research and um, the work that I've done to produce this book without their support. Uh, some have been just amazing and even when they didn't necessarily agree with me. They, they saw value in, in me probing and poking and asking a lot of questions and making a, a general pest of myself. Um, but others were, were, are resistant. And, no, oh, I think we're counting these workers right. I think, you know, you know, yeah, maybe we don't have it exactly right, but, you know, overall the trends are clear. And um, so, uh, and some are, I mean, I mentioned, you know, Berlin having the, passed an Airbnb law and, um, did I, did I, already, I mentioned that to you, but I can't remember. Did I, did I pull the numbers on Airbnb in, you know, in the past year since the law went into effect? Yeah. The, did I mention it to them? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the, the law is not working. So, what do you do? You just keep digging the hole deeper? <laughs> or do you, you suddenly say, 
we've got to do something different. And I, again, I mean, I think data in terms of the future, data is going to emerge as one of the crucial components of our societies. Who controls the data? Is it the commercial companies? Do we control our own data? Does the government have the data it needs to regulate these transactions that are happening in anonymous ways, shadowy ways? Um, you know, if Airbnb won't give up its data and you can't regulate this company and it's just going to, you know, take over your housing stock, what do you do? No one has, has come up with an answer to that. Um, I think one of the things we could do, and this, this, is, this will be a good one to drop at the end of, because uh, then we can, you can all wonder about how it would work out, is that, you know, we actually have the means that if a company isn't following laws and regulations, you can use various digital technologies to basically shut them out. You know, China has already shown how to do that, the Great Wall of China, right? The Great Digital Wall of China. And we, we think like, oh, well, that's censorship. We would never want to do that. But look, you, we have to, we, ha we make, we know, we understand, we have just have to tune in sense you have to protect your physical borders, right? Well, it, it, may, it, re it might reach a point where we have to protect our data borders, that you have companies that refuse to follow the laws, even when you pass new laws. I mean, Airbnb and, and Uber have sat at the table and drafted some of these laws and said, okay, we'll agree to that law, and then they don't even follow the law. In California, they're supposed to, re they're required by the law that they help draft at the state level to give up certain data about how much they're charging, how many drivers, if, if there's any accidents, and they, they instead paid a $13 million fine rather than give the data. So $13 million fine to them is pocket change. So this is the type of company we're talking about. And if they just absolutely won't follow the laws and regulations and are, are causing harm, it seems to me, you know, every computer has an IP address. Every IP address has an a, a geographic location. You could ringtail a country and say, you know, all these IP addresses, uh-uh, you want to have a, a, a co connectivity to them? You have to follow our laws and regulations. If we have an indication that you're not, we're going to cut you out. That would be an extreme thing to do. But, I mean, again, I'll put it to you again. If they won't follow the laws, they know these hosts are breaking the law. They have the data in the case of Airbnb. And, and they, could, they could police themselves. They refuse to do it. What are you going to do? Just let them keep doing it? I mean, that's going to create this sort of pirate mentality that we don't have to follow the laws. We can do what we want. We don't have to pay taxes. That's going to undermine the welfare state. That's where the title, the rather provocative title for my publisher, they said, we need a title that's going to grab eyeballs. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, there's a lot of danger there if we don't get this right. I, I, my fear is we're going to look back 20 years from now and say, wow, we didn't get this right at the moment when we still had a chance to get it right. And now we don't like the society that we have uh, created. So. But I think we can get it right. I think with the right laws and regulations, let's leave on a positive note. We can get this right. <laughs> We just have to talk about it. We have to start proposing new laws, get some new things in place, see how they work. When they don't work, adjust them. Um, this is going on. Many places in the U.S. are, are doing this with, uh, and you know, the other thing I'll mention is um, Austin, Texas, as an example. Uh, Austin City Council, it's a, it's a big Uber city. Uh, it's a university town, people love uh, ride sharing. But the city council said, you know what? We think that for your background checks, we think you should do fingerprinting. Because fingerprinting is a standard. It's what the FBI says is the best. Um, it's what taxi companies do. We want you to do what taxi companies do. And, and, they, and Uber said, no, we won't do that. And if you, if you pass this law, we're pulling out of the city. They passed the law. So what Uber did was they paid $10 million for an initiative, a voter initiative, where you gather signatures, paying people to get signatures, put it on the ballot, let the, the, give the Austin uh, ride-sharing people and uh, the city of, citizens of Austin a chance to repeal this law. And they said, again, if you don't vote for our initiative, and repeal the city council law, we are pulling out. C citizens of Austin didn't like being threatened like that. <laughs> they voted down this initiative. And so Uber was like, ooh, I guess we've got to pull out. And so suddenly ride sharing was gone from one of the best cities uh, that Uber had. Oh. Well, you know what happened? Four new ride sharing companies have, have, <laughs> have happened as a result. So that's, I've suggested if Facebook won't do Facebook the way we want, if Google won't do Google <clears throat> the way we want, if they're going to insist on bombarding us with ads, you know, tracking us, stalking us. They're stalking us online. They have our data. They sell that data. They make all their profit from selling our data. If they're not going to do it the way we want, we have to develop the tools to say, you know what, you can't operate here. The Great Wall of, of, of Germany, 
I know walls aren't popular here. <laughs> walls aren't popular here. But I mean, I think we have to develop the tools so that we, when we are at the table negotiating with them, we have something to say. You know, we have something that we can argue and tell them. Well, if you don't do this, we're, we can do that. We can do this. And right now, they just say, "Oh, pff, good luck." So, that, with that. Thank you, Stephen, again. Thank you this is a wonderful, wonderful last word. And I think. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we are, yes, I guess I would just tell you, we are, you're completely right. We are in the middle of a, of a huge revolution that we all agree upon. And I think uh, societies need rules to organize themselves. And what it, it means in terms of privacy, protection of data, uh, freedom of speech, all these things are. Uh, yeah, are being discussed about. I think your book put a tremendous value on, on this discussion. This book is here. The Steve will be with us for a while. You yeah. can chat with him. He will sign the book. And it, there are foods and drinks. So and help yourself. 15 euros for a copy. Yeah. <laughs> I only have a few copies. So okay, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you again. Well, thank you. That was good.